Gender equity is a human right and it is central to excellence in patient care. It lifts the economy and it makes our communities healthier and safer. This devastating pandemic has shone a spotlight on inequity, but has also given us a unique opportunity to put things right. In this episode of Code Zero, we discuss the issues of gendered inequity, how it impacts on healthcare providers and healthcare consumers, how it is compounded by racism, violence, and the pandemic. And we ask, what each and every one of us can do because each and every one of us has a role. We're proud to collaborate with ComBank on this educational project about gender equity within medicine. We're excited to see the launch of CBA's The Next Chapter programme, addressing domestic and financial abuse. I stand on Bunurong country. Chris is on Gadigal country, and our guests come from as far away as Powhatan country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we stand, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Wherever you are in the world, we ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which you stand. Welcome to Coda Zero. Welcome to Coda Zero. And welcome to Coda Zero. I'm Jessica Stokes Parrish, and I'll be hosting this conversation about gender equity in healthcare. I'm joined by four fabulous guests. I have Kate Ahmad, neurologist and medical activist. I have Elizabeth Broderick, who is the longest serving sex discrimination commissioner in Australia. She's also the founder of Time's Up Healthcare and is also a lawyer. I'm also joined by Amy Tunig, Gomeroy woman and education academic at the University of Macquarie, or Macquarie University rather. Finally, last but not least, Dr. Lauren Powell, who is a doctor and also the VP of Time's Up Healthcare. If you haven't met me before, I'm a nurse and I'm also the chair for Women in Simulation. So if you're joining virtually, welcome. Well, most of you are joining virtually. And so I thank you for joining us and I encourage you to highlight Coda Zero using the hashtag Coda Zero on all socials. And if you have a question, then please include it on the chat box below the screen that you can see there. And if you see a comment or a question that really interests you, then please vote it up so that we can ask it to our panelists. Now, onto the conversation, because I think we could really spend about four hours discussing all of this content, and I don't want to waste another minute. So first, we're on to Dr. Kate, and our first question is, what has been your experience of training in medicine as a woman? Is sexism subtle, or is it overt? I think it's both. So I think that basically you will always have subtle sexism and often this is things like just um, a gender expectation. So you are employing a woman, you are nearly always going to be concerned about is she going to get pregnant, is she going to go and have a baby, go on maternity leave, maybe leave her position. So there's always this slight difference between the way that men and women are perceived. Um, but there's other things as well. So women doctors uh, learn very early on that um, they're often not actually even recognised or seen as a doctor. So we are often thought to be nurses or physiotherapists because they're more female dominated uh, areas. Um, we'll do a ward round and often it'll be the male medical student to whom all of the questions are directed at because they look more doctorly than the female consultant. Um, we even had a case where a surgeon was operating, doing open heart surgery. She opened the chest, did the surgery, and as she was closing, the male physio student who was observing said to her, oh, do nurses always open the chest? So even after she'd done all of that, he still didn't think she was a doctor. So there's all of this. And then you get patients who are much more likely to comment on your appearance, who are asked, likely to ask you about your relationship status. Um, so things which just undermine the actual position of a woman as a doctor. But then there is overt sexism. And I recently collated the experiences of some um, doctors from medical students all the way up to consultants. And to be honest, they're absolutely horrifying, a lot of them. So um, just as one example, one woman describes a male surgeon um, whom she would assist in theatre. And he would ask her to stand so close to him that he could feel her breasts pressing up against him. And she became so nauseous that she had to take Maxillon before she assisted him in theatre because she was so disturbed by this. So another surgeon didn't let pregnant trainees in his theatre because he considered them to be bad luck. 
Um, so not only sexist, but also impairing the training of these people. Um, and then it's not just other medical staff that women have problems with, it's patients as well. And patients can be quite difficult to manage because there's a power imbalance, so you're treating the patient. And so it's quite hard to discipline a man who might be confused and sick, who gropes you or makes sexually inappropriate comments. One recent example of uh, absolutely blatant sexism and objectification is an orthopaedics textbook that recently came to my attention. So a medical student sent this in to me because this was actually the recommended textbook um, for her university for studying orthopaedics. And as you can see, it's full of scantily clad women who were actually later revealed to be page three models from the UK. Um, and they're wearing see-through tops and hot pants. And even when they're having their fingers um, looked at you can see that you know what you you can see nipples present which is just completely inappropriate so i think that even when we're a medical student level women are being told that no you're not a colleague you're an object and orthopedics in particular has a woman problem only three percent of orthopedic surgeons are women and you can see if this is the teaching material it's not going to be a particularly um, appealing culture for women to enter into so we are all aware of these problems, but they've been quite difficult to manage. So female doctors have um, reported actually going to management and saying that these things have happened to them. And they're often told that it's a joke or oh, that, that consultant, he's known for that, he's very handsy. You just have to put up with it. Don't worry about it too much. And in the worst cases, it's turned around so that the female is the problem and not the male who's perpetrated this sexual harassment or abuse. So I think we really need much better systems for calling this out. So we need to protect the women that actually um, come forward and talk about these things. Um, and we need to, I'll just put up, sorry. Um, we need to make sure that other people are calling it out too. So it has to become a normal thing that if you see something which is inappropriate, you actually call it out, um, male or female. You don't just you know, stand by and keep your mouth shut because that perpetuates the behaviour. And if it's called out in public, it's less likely to have a, a negative impact on the person that's calling it out. Um, we need codes of conduct. So we have them at our hospitals for social media use and behaviour around patients, but we really need them specifically about treatment of women. And there needs to be consequences is when things happen which are like this, which are offensive and demeaning. Kate, you touched on um, the fact that orthopaedics, for example, only has, what was it, 3% um, female consultants. So I guess that kind of touches on career progression. And I'm wondering, do women progress in their career the same as men or what are the differences? Well, at the start, so women enter medical school at about the same rate as men, sometimes even a little bit more. So there's no problem with getting into medical school. We are accepting women in. But as they ascend the career ladder, you see this steady rate of attrition as they fall behind their male colleagues. And this is probably a combination of sexism, of a system that's really been set up for and by men, um, and unequal family roles as well. So it's also a societal problem in the background. So we know that um, women in the leadership positions in the hospital, so if you're going all the way up to the CEO, they're only 12.5% of hospital CEOs. And in medical schools, they're only about 28% of the deans of medical schools. And this kind of thing, you know, it, it has big influence on the culture of a place and the curriculum in the medical school. Then you look at specialists, and only about a third of specialists are actually female. And it's worse in surgery, where only about 10% um, of surgical trainees are female. And this is not because women are not interested in surgery. They cite different reasons. So one is that there's a, there is a boys club culture. It's not particularly welcoming to women. It doesn't necessarily value the attributes that they can specifically offer. The training's really inflexible. So women, a lot of them are gonna get pregnant and have babies. But if that happens to you, you can't move to a different city or state every three to six months. You need to do part-time training some of the time. Um, and these options are not very available. And there's also just blatant gender discrimination where these female trainees are not considered to be as appealing as male trainees. So um, one of our big uh, challenges is actually keeping women in the areas of medicine that they choose because it's really valuable to have women specialists available. Uh, we know that some female patients, many female patients prefer to see a woman doctor. We know that female physicians and surgeons often have better patient outcomes. So there's been several studies which have actually shown a slightly increased um, 
better outcome in patients treated by female physicians. So we need diversity. And just along that point, these problems are actually much more um, worse in people of a non-white background. So there's a combination of things, but generally, um, you know, we've got racism, sexism and societal inequity, which is influencing the way that women progress in medicine. It's really interesting too that you raise these percentages because often even in nursing there's an assumption that nursing doesn't have a gender equity problem. And the interesting thing is when you look at the statistics, although there are fewer men within the nursing profession, which is something we'd like to rectify, it's the men that typically climb to the top. Now, you, you kind of touched on this negative impact on medical training, et cetera. I'm just wondering, in terms of conferences, what, what are the negative impacts or the barriers around that? Um, well, when we think about medical conferences, um, we think about, um, firstly, who attends them and then who are the speakers and the panels that are at those conferences. So when you think about attendance, to attend a medical conference, you need to have free time and you need to be able to get there. And the problem for women is that a lot of the time they are the carers of their children and that is often unequal. Even if they have partners at home, the burden of caring for the children falls on the woman. Also, the majority of single parents are also female. So that means that you have to find childcare. We know that some conferences are starting to offer childcare and things like lactation rooms, but it's certainly not the um, norm. And then it often um, incurs an extra cost. So you've got to pay for the childcare as well as paying for the very expensive mm -hmm. conference and all of the travel that comes along with it. So even just attending can be a, a difficult for women. Then you've got your speakers and your panels. So we know that women are underrepresented as speakers. So about one third of speakers at medical conferences are women. Um, and then it gets even worse when you look at things like panels. So everyone's heard of the manual where it's all men. There are about 35% of um, panels at conferences, only about two to 3% are all women. So that's a pretty concerning statistic. Um, compounding that, often those panels are all white as well. So you've got all white men on a panel, which doesn't really give you um, a nice diverse uh, sort of opinion on what's being talked about. So, um, the problem here is that if you don't have women speakers and women experts getting up and talking, you don't have role models for junior doctors and scientists that are up and coming, and you don't hear women's voices and perspectives on these medical issues. Uh, the other, when you're at a conference, often it's where you network with colleagues from around the, the country or the globe, and it's where you collaborate on things like research projects. So if you're not up there being heard, then you won't get the same amount of things like job opportunities and you won't get the same research opportunities. So what we thought was that even with conferences, people do select male speakers more, often because they're more visible in the community. It's not necessarily a deliberate thing. It's sometimes a subconscious bias. So we've actually set up um, Women Speakers in Healthcare, which is an organisation where we've actually got a database of women experts who are willing to speak at conferences. And then if people are setting up a conference and realise that they've got a manual or that they've got all male speakers, they can actually come to us and we can help them find a female speaker to try and address this inequality. Fantastic. Um, I could see the rest of our panellists were nodding in agreement. And I'm just wondering, Lauren, if you have something to add there, especially from that medical perspective. Yes, I, I want to appreciate um, Kate's comments so much. Um, so many of the challenges that, that you uh, spoke on are a direct mirror reflection of the challenges we see in the U.S. healthcare system as well. Um, the challenges of women trying to ascend to uh, the top to break the proverbial glass ceiling, um, challenges both mirrored in um, the medical field and, and with nursing and with um, physicians, as well as in public health. Um, that we know public health here is overwhelmingly made up of women. When we go to any school public health, overwhelmingly we see women there. But when it comes to leadership, we do not see enough women. Um, everything that you, you, you touched on uh, is, is spot on and everything that, that we're also seeing in the United States. That's also what Times of Healthcare uh, really was created to, to fight against and um, to create gender equity in the healthcare workplace. And we are thinking about so many of the challenges that you have brought up 
inclusive of the childcare crisis that we're seeing right now, um, the challenges that COVID has has uh, resurfaced. And really, I think it's important that we recognize many of these challenges have been here all along, right? It's just that there was only a small section of the population perhaps who really had to deal with this every day. Um, so childcare crises, pay inequities, um, requesting and kind of pushing for hazard pay for our healthcare workers who are really putting their lives on the line as they continue to do their jobs and try to keep all of us safe. So I see so many parallels um, in many of the comments that you made. I think we'll hold that thought around how COVID is highlighting those deeply embedded um, inequities because Liz is going to take us through some of that. We've got some questions from the audience. The first one I think segues beautifully into what you've talked about, Lauren. How do we get more females into leadership roles in healthcare? What's your take on that, Lauren? Sure. Um, well, I think first and foremost, you know, it's really important that we continue to raise awareness. Uh, it kind of sounds really like uh, surface level maybe, but I think there's still a need to continue to raise awareness of the fact that there are not enough women in leadership to begin with. Um, when we look around, um, your statistics that you shared were, were so um, interesting and they're even worse in the United States. Um, I think percentages of women who are in, in executive positions in healthcare are in the single digits. So um, I think it's first and foremost, continuing to raise awareness that there is a problem. Um, but then we really have to look at the ways that promotions are, are, are um, happening. Like what is a decision process and what is a, the decision making process behind promotion? Um, what are the intrinsic qualities that are um, that, that folks are looking for to promote women into leadership. Um, and I think by and large, when we go back, we will find the old boys network mm -hmm. is, is what has uh, created such a smooth transition for so many men into these positions. Um, and so I think this takes pushing many of our boards, um, the boards of hospitals and the boards of our healthcare organizations. I think um, thinking about sort of the accreditation processes for many of our healthcare organizations and making gender equity, as well as so many other um, forms of equity that we need to see within these systems, making those things that those systems have to be held accountable for um, in order to be accredited. Um, and then creating more of a pipeline and opportunities for women to to lift as we climb, right? To pull others up as we are then ascending into the next position. Thank can you. I just add, yes. Lauren, because I agree with all that and everything that Kate says, I see it in every industry, to be honest, not just healthcare. But I think we have to be more disruptive and more radical. And the fact that healthcare is a situation where women deliver global health and men lead it, that is so unacceptable given the number of women in the sector. It's a highly feminized sector, yet it's still men who lead it. So I think we need to look at targets, quotas, whatever you want to say. I call it because the fact is the talent's there. It's just that the way the whole system's constructed means that women are either intentionally or unintentionally excluded. And that's what that's what's leading to the current situation. So I think we have to disrupt. I think we need men on board as well. Um, and we really need to set some hard targets and quotas uh, because it's not a it's not a situation where we have no female talent. We've got huge female talent just not getting to the top. Thank you so much, Liz. That segues perfectly into the final question for Kate, which is, what's your advice to male leaders in medicine? How do we respond? Um, that's a tough one. I think there are some male leaders in medicine who are not going to be particularly receptive to the idea of increasing women in medicine. I've actually heard some of them say things like women don't want leadership roles, they just choose not to go into them. So I think there are people there that are almost unreachable to a degree. There are certainly allies and these people are really important because they can also help in mentoring the younger generation of male uh, physicians and surgeons who are ascending up the healthcare ladder because we need to actually change the whole culture, I think, to, to really see change at the top. Um, obviously, you have to be conscious of this. You can't just, it's a bit like racism. You can't just say, 
say, I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, and because I don't do anything bad to other people, you actually have to go out of your way to address the issues. So male leaders need to actually make sure that they are selecting women for conference presentations and that they are looking at women in an equal way when they're selecting people for jobs. Um, and I think what Lauren said about looking at the at healthcare accreditation and actually making gender equity a really important and objective measure might actually go some way to seeing some progress and disrupt. I like that a lot. I think disruption is great.